Thank you, George, for that great introduction. Thierry, can I start with you? Oh. Good morning, good afternoon to all of you who are uh, watching our State of the Union conference online and welcome to the panel, What is the Future of uh, Global Value Chains? A, a number of panels in, in this conference have uh, addressed the notion of strategic autonomy and they've done it, they've tended to do it from the geopolitical sense, focusing on the issue of, of security. But strategic autonomy has also a geoeconomic geo sense and at the core of that is global value chains. The development of, of complex and, and dense global value chains is perhaps the, the hallmark of 21st century globalization. They bring together global firms, production, trade, investment with consumers in what seemed to be, at least until now, a borderless world. But COVID-19 has put in question all this. It has disrupted uh, and, and often completely damaged uh, existing uh, global supply chains. And, and it has started a discussion at the EU level on whether we need to repatriate or at least acquire domest domestic capability in certain critical sectors. So there's a number of questions here. Are we moving from just in time to just in case to just here? And how does this link with the EU's industrial strategy? Now to discuss these issues, we are very fortunate uh, to have with us uh, Commissioner Thierry Breton and Professor Richard Baldwin. Commissioner uh, Breton is responsible for the internal market at the European Commission. His wide portfolio includes the, uh, in the, the strategy for uh, industrial firms to lead in the green and digital transition, as well as the coordination of the strategy for artificial intelligence. He has taught leadership and corporate accountability at Harvard. He has been the French Minister of Economy, Finance and Industry, and he has been the CEO of uh, uh, leading uh, uh, firms uh, such as uh, company Atos, France Telecom, and uh, uh, Thomson Multimedia. Welcome, Commissioner. Thank you. Professor uh, Baldwin, uh, Richard Baldwin is a professor of international economics at the Graduate Institute uh, Geneva, and he's the founder and editor of Vox EU. He advises government and international uh, organizations around, around the globe on globalization and trade policy issues. Among his recent books, uh, The Great Convergence, cited as one of the best group, uh, group, uh, books on globalization, and the more recent, the Globotics Upheaval, Globalization, Robotics, and the Future of Work. The discussion will be moderated by uh, uh, the Financial Times International Business Editor, Peggy Hollinger. And Peggy, I will hand this over to you. Thank you very much, George, um, I, for that great introduction. And Thierry, I'd be very keen to start with you. You said uh, yourself during the pandemic that Europe needs to re-examine its sort of supply chain dependencies and strategic sectors, and the European Parliament has declared that it supports the reintegration of supply chains inside the EU. You've just finished revising the EU's new industrial strategy, as a part of which you've done an extensive study of the bloc's dependencies. Have you decided that Europe needs to relocalize its supply chains? Can you talk to us a bit about what you found out and what you've decided in the strategy? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, um, good morning, Peggy. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, uh, Richard, and I'm very happy to be with you today. Uh, a few words to start, yes, to tell you that it's true that um, uh, a few days ago, uh, we updated our industrial strategy because we thought it was appropriate to draw the lessons that we learned since we issued our first uh, industrial strategy uh, uh, announcement, let's say, exactly uh, one year ago. And, and maybe maybe the first lesson uh, that we could draw from the COVID-19 crisis is that maybe Europe has been, uh, has been in the past too naive. Uh, let's take two examples. Uh, first, um, um, uh, uh, when we suffered, uh, when we suffered, let's say um, uh, uh, the consequences of decisions by some of our uh, closest partners. The first one, of course, I would like to take is uh, is the one um, um, of, uh, of of um, vaccines and also the case of semiconductors, uh, where uh, for the vaccines, of course, we are we, we have seen that because of executive order, uh, we have been strongly eaten, and we had to. Um, 
uh, to rainy shit as a supply chain. I, I may elaborate and you know exactly what I mean. And by the way, uh, as a consequence, uh, believe it or not, in one year, uh, uh, Europe will become the first uh, continent in terms of vaccine production. But we had to do this uh, to be able to secure our supply chain based off uh, the behavior of um, some of our partners. And the second one uh, was, of course, in semiconductors, where we faced a shortage following an executive order respecting the use and export. Uh, in both areas, of course, um, we, we suffered also the consequences, to be honest, on our own decision in the past. Uh, we let ourselves to be dependent on components uh, for vaccines and also for the for the uh, semiconductors, where we saw uh, our market share to grow from uh, uh, let's say to from forty percent uh, twenty five years ago to now nine uh, percent. Uh, but again, as I said, uh, um, we all decided uh, uh, in Brussels that the time of naivety then uh, um, is uh, how should I find it over. Uh, Europe is now taking a more uh, assertive approach. That doesn't mean, of course, uh, that uh, we will switch to a planned economy, as I can hear sometimes, uh, or that we uh, want to reshore everything. Of course not. This is stupid. Europe is and will remain an open continent. It is uh, in our DNA. It means just that we want to use in full our strengths to harness our industrial ambition, uh, to reinforce our single market, and of course, to uh, achieve our green uh, digital and resilience objectives and to continue to compete uh, globally, but on a fair footing. Uh, this uh, time is about, of course, transforming and projecting uh, Europe. Um, and by the way, to our friends and partners, I want to say very clearly, uh, Europe uh, will always remain open, but of course, uh, uh, on our terms. Member states and industry uh, fully agree with us, by the way, on the importance of addressing strategic dependencies. Um, by the way, we are not alone huh, here. Uh, both the US and China are actively uh, reviewing their position in global value chains and uh, taking actions accordingly. And I'm sure that uh, Professor Baldwin will write a new book on this because this is maybe a new trend. I will, uh, I will be eager to hear what they will have to say on this. But, but uh, the pandemic, uh, uh, to be, um, to, be, to, to be clear, has definitely uh, exposed the vulnerabilities of, um, of many segments, including of our digital space, uh, its dependencies also on uh, non-European technologies and the risk linked to a disruption, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in global value chain. And it is clear that also our green and both digital ambitions will further amplify our needs uh, and therefore the risk of being uh, overly dependent on uh, one uh, or a couple of suppliers. So some strategic dependencies could uh, definitely, yes, I should say, uh, honestly, you're by surprise. For example, of course, uh, mask uh, or, or components of growth. But it's true also that within uh, five to six months, we have been able to, um, uh, to reinstall uh, uh, an industry and now that we are fully dependent in, in this uh, component. Uh, so of course, uh, in the future, we should probably uh, be better prepared because, of course, we will have a better understanding of, of our strategic dependencies and capacity needs. So our industrial strategy, uh, Peggy, uh, to answer to your direct your questions, uh, presents a first analysis of the EU's dependencies based on a bottom-up robust analysis of 5,000 products. Um, uh, beyond products, we looked at a number of advanced technologies of key importance to enhance future competitiveness. And combining the bottom-up results and the analysis of strategic capacity needs, we then perform six in-depth reviews on hydrogen, raw materials, batteries, semiconductors, active pharmaceuticals ingredients. And our work, of course, will not stop here. Uh, once we have identified uh, dependencies, um, now, of course, we need to address them and we will carry uh, out a range of action to do so. Uh, uh, we will also reinforce uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, our, our uh, opportunities that we may see uh, thanks to our uh, global trade and global and, uh, trade tools. We will therefore work uh, towards diversifying international supply chains and pursuing international partnership. Uh, uh, but in some cases, we need also to increase, it's true, our domestic uh, capacity in certain strategic areas. I mentioned semiconductors. Uh, uh, and we will, of course, uh, um, uh, announce a lot of actions here in, in the next few uh, uh, weeks or even days. 
um, uh, definitely our ambition is to uh, lead the technological race uh, and invest uh, uh, in more powerful uh, and more energy efficient uh, processors. And we have the tool and the financing now available uh, to do this. So we don't need to, uh, we don't, we cannot afford to miss uh, the window uh, 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 of opportunities that we have uh, ahead of us. So um, this is, this is uh, um, what I could say at the beginning. Um, uh, uh, one word to end to tell you that, of course, we will announce also few aims in some specific areas, uh, like semiconductors, like industrial clouds, uh, like also space launchers, uh, like uh, uh, aircraft of the future. Um, and, uh, and of course, I will be very happy to, uh, um, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to discuss uh, this uh, later on. Thank you very much, Peggy. Brilliant. Thank you. That's absolutely fascinating, Thierry, and clearly uh, examining the dependencies in 5,000 products. I mean, I, I read that and it, it looks like very detailed work. Uh, Richard, I'm going to come to you a little bit because the task that the EU is setting itself is quite a vast and complex task. I mean, can you talk to me a bit about the state of these global value chains and how, how difficult a challenge like this is to eradicate or address these strategic vulnerabilities? Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, I had the chance to look at the report um, yesterday and a bit this morning. It's, I think it's very well done, very impressive and balanced. Unlike a, a lot of them, it's not a knee-jerk reaction. Everything has to be made at home. Um, but, but there is this 5,000 products, for example, that's based on statistics that don't really tell you where it's made. They tell you where it's shipped from. But just for example, um, I, I, I did some calculations with uh, Rebecca Friedman on what we call total foreign, reli total foreign reliance. And you can see, for instance, Germany, Britain, France, about four to five percent of their entire industrial input is coming from China. But the same is true for the US. And when, when you don't really understand that things that you're importing from the US are partly made in China, you're missing a lot of uh, strategic uh, uh, dependencies. So I think it's really important to use to understand that, especially in these products like pharmaceuticals and medical supplies, where stuff is made is a complicated question. And very frequently you have to go into the case studies as I've, se I've seen you have done in certain cases, but I would very much uh, encourage you know, to, to look further and, and really see who's doing, doing what. And that will involve a pretty massive investment in information gathering, uh, which I think a number of nations are doing, but it's already started a little bit at places like the OECD with the trade and value added uh, network. But let me just give you one very specific example. In this report, Vietnam is listed as the second highest provider of inputs, but much of what Vietnam exports is based on inputs from China. So China's number one, Vietnam's number two. But I think if you actually looked at the global value chain perspective, Vietnam would nowhere be, would be nowhere near up at number two. It's misreflecting what's coming actually from China. So I, I have lots more to say, but I'll, I'll just leave it at that. It's, it's super complicated and it's super important to do, but we'll have to make, make a harder job at it. So Thierry, when, when you hear what Richard says about the kind of indirect inputs even to where you have the, the Europe sees its dependencies. Um, how do you how do you think you can address that? And do you ha have you got specific tools to address that? Oh. Uh, Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, that's a very good question because it was a, a lot of discussion that we had in our house. And by the way, uh, uh, we worked heavily uh, to try to answer to this very very relevant question. And in fact, uh, we identified uh, uh, after uh, in depth analysis. Um, um, uh, 137 product uh, where we have been able really to identify uh, 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 what was needed. And in this 137 product, taking into account everything that uh, Richard was describing, 34, which are absolutely critical, where we finally uh, find uh, the origin. And then we decided that for this 34 product, we need to act. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and by the way, when we said acting, it means, of course, um, uh, if we can, uh, to a diverse uh, uh, um, source of our, our procurement, it could be difficult, for example, in a rare, rare earth, for example, because we know that 98% is coming from China. So it means that the second thing will be uh, uh, recycling and circular uh, uh, economy, uh, which is probably something that we will develop 
heavily and invest heavily in this product. All, of course, the third level, uh, but uh, um, this is something I'm sure that uh, Professor Baldwin will love. It means innovation, maybe trying to find something else, invest more. So that's the three level that for this 34 product, uh, uh, following exactly the process that uh, uh, Richard has been described, that we will propose, uh, let's say, not alternative, but complementary uh, 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 additional uh, uh, strategy. Thank you. Um, the, the OECD has done, as you mentioned, the global value um, unit of uh, the OECD. They, they have done several reports where they say if we try to unpick the global value chain, it actually leads to lower growth and, and lower jobs, uh, lower value, in fact, for the country that tries to unpick or pull out of the global value chain. Richard, I'd like to ask you, are there examples in the past of countries that have tried to reduce that of in, in particular sectors or particular sectors themselves that have tried to address this question of dependencies? Sure. So but let, let me just say that uh, the, the big problem is when the individual company doesn't fully realize the cost of a supply shock. So all sorts of industries know about all sorts of supply shocks. But what we need to look at is a situation where the private cost of a supply disruption is way less than the public cost. And two classic examples of that are agriculture and military equipment. And countries all over the world for decades have very expensive, very elaborate policies in order to ensure a continuance of supply in, uh, in, in really bad disruptions. So we, we've learned how to do that in certain industries. And I think what COVID taught us is that probably we should have put medical supplies or at least some parts of it and some types of pharmaceutical supplies in that same pot as agriculture where you, know, you can't rely on the farmers to undertake all the things necessary to keep the country uh, eating during a, a you know, big, big crisis. So that, that, that I, would, I would draw on a, a kind of a, an analogy that what we should do with these couple dozen sectors, which are really critical, is learn from how we've made it work in agriculture and to a certain extent, military equipment, which, which is, uh, and, in, and the report, by the way, is very even handed in terms of stockholding and alliances and diversifying supplies. So it's not a knee jerk, like you, you hear often, we have to bring it all at home. So uh, I, 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 th I think that it, that is a, a, a good analogy. And in that, for example, in agriculture, the WTO has a set of rules about export restrictions only on food, where they, they're allowed, but they have to be temporary, they have to be motivated, and you have to notify your partners about it. But we don't have that for medical equipment, for instance. So that, that's the sort of thing that could be put in, lessons learned from that. And if I could just add, get one more last point in is, when we do this kind of industrial policy and strategic dependence, it's important to put in structure. Because I remember I was in the US-Japan conflict in semiconductors and uh, strategic trade policy back then. And the trouble was that the vested interests captured the process and we ended up pushing all sorts of things that weren't very important, powdered metals and satellites and stuff like that. So you need a structure. And I think this report is a good start of it, but you really do need structured analysis that goes forward to avoid the capture and avoid fashion. The things are fashionable here, so we'll do this, we'll do that. But um, I'll, I'll, I'll just stop there, thanks. Well, Thierry, I'd be really curious to, because in your report, you talk a bit about an observatory that every two years reports and sets out a roadmap for where the technology is going and what we consider is critical. Do you think that's enough structure or or is, is, is there something else in your mind that you think the Europe needs to actually develop in order to ensure that, ensure that that roadmap is followed? Well, you know, again, it's a very, very complex issue and it's, it's, it's very difficult to... Uh, to have a general view on this. And I think more and more, uh, we need to look at it uh, on, on a case-by-case -case, uh, um, uh, way because uh, uh, there's a lot of differences. We spoke about, uh, for example, uh, uh, pharmaceutical ingredients. We are speaking about uh, uh, semiconductors. Uh, we need also, you know, I, I just wanted to give you an example of what I had to cope with. Uh, uh, as you know, um, I have been tasked by, by the EU to, um, to be the, uh, the, the chief of the EU um, uh, vaccine task force uh, uh, in, in early February to make sure that we'll be able to ramp up and to, and let's say, to, uh, to, 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 to be really honest, to make sure that we, 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 we could be able to, um, um, uh, to make sure that our supply chain 
uh, will work. Because unfortunately, uh, I should tell you that uh, uh, we have a lot of issues, and especially with the US after the executive order, which has been taken, um, uh, not only to block uh, uh, any ex export of, of vaccines worldwide, and by the way, um, this is still, uh, uh, as you know, a, a process, and it's, it's creating a lot of issue for a lot of countries. So only Europe now is, uh, is, 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 is vaccinating the world. Uh, and uh, it's a little bit a heavy task for us, but still we are doing it uh, for our fellow citizens and for 90, 90 countries depending on us. Uh, but in addition to this, uh, this executive order was blocking the components uh, in the supply chains. And, 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 and this, uh, of course, we have been able to, en to enhance to uh, accelerate the, uh, the ramp up of factories. But it's true that we have a lot of our, uh, um, let's say, companies, European companies, having some factories 100% uh, uh, owned by European companies in the US and being blocked to send uh, filters, uh, uh, let's say, uh, lipids, uh, key components, uh, just because of this order. So we put ourselves, um, we decided, which is something pretty unusual for Europe, uh, we decided to. Um, to, um, uh, to put in place uh, 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 very urgently an instrument uh, uh, saying that uh, uh, we uh, uh, now uh, will have the uh, uh, possibility to block uh, any export uh, uh, from outside of the uh, EU, um, including, by the way, components, uh, if uh, the other counterpart um, uh, do not uh, fulfill reciprocity. And this tool uh, helped me to, uh, let's say, how should I phrase it? reopen um, uh, 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 more balanced dialogue. Just, this is just an example to tell you that uh, we hope it's not naive. Peggy, this will have been impossible uh, two or three years ago in Europe. Mm. So, uh, so we have been forced to do it. And then and this tool, yes, uh, helped us to restart, let's say, a better uh, functioning of the supply chain. I give you this example because, of course, you will not apply this in other areas, but at least we learned and you know, Europe is, is moving ahead like in, a, uh, let's say, quantum physics. Uh, uh, you have to make a leap uh, uh, and uh, that's, you need a lot of energy, but when we are on a new orbit, you are on this new orbit and you don't fall down. So this is what happened in the past few months. Fascinating. Well, it is very much an example in a crisis like this um, of when political politics essentially gets in the way of, of what the world actually needs, isn't it? It's one of the things that strikes me that political rhetoric, um, sometimes it goes a lot further, certainly than your report did. As you say, you, Europe remains open to free trade. But I do wonder this political rhetoric and the growing feeling that in times of crisis, we're vulnerable. You talk about building alliances, diversifying the supply chain, but ultimately those alliances mean nothing in a time of crisis if the politicians are going to act on their own. We saw this week the United States decide immediately on its own that it would waive the IP for, for vaccines. So I, 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 one of my questions, I suppose, is do you think that we are now moving away from this idea of global free trade towards a world of protectionism, where even with the best efforts of trying to create alliances to improve the resilience with your allies, you can't count on those? Is it, is it the end of this free trade doctrine? And no matter how hard you try, that, um, you know, what does that mean? basically, for how we have to rethink and the impact on our economies. Who wants to take that one first? Richard. <laughs> uh, okay, yep. so let, let me try. So, so first of all, this free trade doctrine is a, a cartoon caricature you see in the, in the press. And as I mentioned in agriculture, uh, inter government intervention and regulations and export controls, that's old, old news in agriculture. And we've learned how to deal with it. And the way we dealt with it is the WTO has a set of rules that discipline the kinds of things that countries can do. And it's rules-based rather than just idiosyncratic. And I think the lesson there is we have to move that sort of stuff at least into medical, uh, medical equipment. Um, but more generally, I, I, my, my book, The Great Convergence, points out that globalization sub changed substantially in 1990 because essentially factories were crossing borders, not just goods. And the whole idea that everybody does what they're good at and imports the rest, that's based in a world where just goods are crossing. And even then it's, it, it's, it's complicated. But what this change with the interconnected production means that what people do in, inside their country, seemingly nothing to do with trade, can have a big effect on other countries. And that leads to a need to have a more systemic 
kind of cooperation uh, agreement. So I don't think free trade is, is done, but just as you see free trade agreements no longer just being about free trade, regional trade agreements are much deeper uh, services, intellectual property rights, short-term movement of people, all that sort of stuff is in there because the factories are crossing borders. So the game, the nature of trade has changed and the rules have to ch evolve with it. The second bit of that, I think, which is really dramatic is that governments didn't re are behind the curve in figuring out how complex the world production structure is. Um, and it's not in every industry, but in some industries it is. And what you see with this kind of report is they're trying to catch up first on the information to know where the vulnerabilities is, whereas that wasn't particularly difficult to know or important before the factories started crossing borders in the way they are now. So really a lot of this has to do with, we need more information to do the right policies. And as always, there'll be a mixture of protection and support and subsidies that come out of it. So I don't, I don't think except for a few extreme economists that, that seem to get on the news a lot, that free trade is always and everywhere a good thing. I, I, I don't think that has been the case for a good long time, but this is, this is a really a information problem, I think, rather than a paradigm shift. Thierry, your view? Uh, well, yeah, no, I, I think we will continue, of course. Uh, I, I fully agree with what uh, Richard said, but um, but I would like to, to give you maybe two or three, uh, uh, let's say, um, highlights. Um, the first one, by the way, for what I said at, uh, uh, before, uh, when we put in place this tool, the good thing is that it existed, but I didn't use it. But it ex the way that it existed suddenly makes things a little bit more, more how should I phrase it, uh, uh, easy to work with. Uh, so it means, that, it means that at the end of the day, uh, uh, what is the lesson learned? It is that more and more, um, uh, of course we will need multilateralism, but from continent to continent, and this is what is at stake, at least for us in Europe, um, this will be more and more a balance of power. So first we need to understand where is our power? You know, this is like building a bridge. Uh, uh, you need pillars. So we need to have a strong pillar in Europe. And then, of course, strong pillar in the US, strong pillar in Asia, in China, whatever. And then you could build the bridge. But we need to know how to build our pillar. And this is my job. And, and, and I think that's very important, including, you know, when, when we are talking, uh, we're talking in the, exa the example of, of um, 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 semiconductors, uh, um, it, it's important. Uh, we, we need to know what we have and we need to know also, of course, how to invite our partners, but on our rules and making sure that we'll be able to, uh, um, let's say, uh, have, um, let's say, a tool uh, to guarantee the security of supply. Because now not only you need to have a good and fair trade, but for some critical components, you need also to have the tools to build something which will allow you to have the security of supply. And that's maybe a new component that we didn't have in the past. And that's not, I mean, and, and, and we need to, 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 to invent it while, while, while working. So I don't know if we do it wrong or right, but we need to move. And, uh, and, 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 and this is why I, I'm saying that it is be probably more and more based on um, common dependencies, uh, um, um, uh, and and also, you know, all my life I made partnerships. Even if when, when I was in the in, in the in the private sectors, I mean, I made many 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 partnerships. And a partnership is always, at the end of the day, about managing your balance of power. You need to be able to give something if you want to receive something. If you are one hundred percent dependent, I mean, you are in a bad position. Believe me, as a CEO, I know what it means. So I mean, of course, there's nothing to compare, but building an appropriate uh, uh, balance uh, 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 cooperation in certain areas will be probably what we will need. Do you think, I mean, that leads us quite nicely onto one of my other questions really there. I mean, this is, if Europe is thinking about this, we know the United States is thinking about this. We know that China is thinking about this. You know, each individual region country is, is thinking about this. Isn't there a role, a stronger role for the WTO in this? Do we need a kind of rethink of WTO rules or involvement in how we manage these dependencies and these partnerships? Richard? Ah, well, people already know what I'm going to say. The answer is yes. Uh, and, uh, and so it'd be more interesting to hear what Terry has to say. But let me just okay. 
Rush, well, let me Go just rush in that the current DG is wide open to using the WTO as a coordinating device on medical supplies and pharma in particular. And I, I, I think this, this is a good, the WTO is a good place because China is not in charge, EU is not in charge, US isn't in charge. And we have a, a, a leader at the WTO who actually knows all about vaccines and medical stuff and is very interested in, in, in reinvigorating the, the institution's profile by making it a place where it saves lives, not just business. So, uh, but I, I'll, I would love to hear what uh, Terry has to think about the role of the WTO. Oh, it's very simple. Huh? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm totally in line with you. Um, we need a good reset. We need a good reset because, of course, things have changed. Uh, so, I mean, uh, um, uh, I, I, I really think that uh, uh, we have already uh, things which are working. Uh, uh, but, of course, uh, uh, we, 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 we definitely, that's a huge, huge task. But um, uh, uh, we have already some, some good uh, existing rules. So we could, we, could, we, could, we could build on it. But everything we said since the beginning, means that, yes, we need definitely to have, a, to, have, to, to, to have a reset. So I don't want to elaborate longer, but I, I'm, 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 I'm here in, in, the, in the commission. I'm, uh, I belong to, um, to the commissioner who believes that we need to be, um, to be a, a, a very, uh, let's say, ambitious on this reset. Reset, OK. Thank, thank you. Um, I, I should also remind the audience that uh, we will be taking questions at the end of this session. So please do send in your questions uh, on the facility down at the bottom of your screen. Um, I suppose one of the other things that struck me, we've talked a lot about strategic dependencies in, in this conversation, presuming everybody knows how you define what a strategic sector is. And it strikes me it might be helpful. Are there differing views on what are the criteria to define a strategic sector? Um, Thierry, what was, how did you define what was strategic? What well, were the criteria first, you first used? I will, tell you, I will tell you, I don't like the word strategic. OK. Because when you, when you speak about strategic, it is an excuse to do all kinds of mistakes. <laughs> so uh, uh, so I, I, I hate t t this one. I know that I, I, I feel sometimes a little bit alone because more and more uh, member states are using it. But personally, as a commissioner, I don't like it. I will bre bre definitely prefer to, to, to see, to have the approach that we, that we did, very pragmatical, and, and, um, and, 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 and to see again uh, where we need to be more autonomous in our decision. In other words, not depending on others. And, and, and you know, um, um, it means, of course, this is what I said at the beginning, uh, because there's a lot of questions. Oh, we want to, you want to do this industrial strategy and, uh, and everything, because then you will have to uh, 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 um, uh, reposition uh, everything in Europe. It's a, it's a way. And it's not my view. It is just, again, uh, and, and I really insist again on this. We need to be able to to have the munitions uh, to to um, uh, to discuss. Uh, arm, uh, I mean, uh, uh, um, on an equal basis with our global suppliers. That's it. So that's really uh, uh, and for in, not everywhere, but in certain areas. And and this is why. Give me. A, let me give you an example. Um, uh, um, we are um, uh, dependent in in a lot of uh, uh, areas and critical raw materials. And here, of course. Uh, so, so um, uh, uh, I decided to uh, to uh, start a, a, a very interesting exercise uh, to have a, a full mapping of what we know uh, is existing in Europe. So it doesn't mean that we will reopen mines everywhere. Uh, it's a little bit complex. It takes time, uh, uh, but at least we know that it exists. And you know, just making this exercise, Peggy. Uh, started me to, 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 to enter into uh, 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 better discussions with some of our suppliers. Uh, um, uh, but it means also that in some areas, let's take the lithium, for example. And I mean, lithium, we need, we need uh, as you know, lithium for batteries. And we, did, we realized that we were 100% dependent on lithium from uh, one or two uh, countries. Then after this exercise, uh, we know that we have now enough lithium in Europe to be self-sufficient uh, uh, within the next, not 10 years, five years, if we work well, mm -hmm. well yes. So, I mean, and, and, and by the way, in our plans, in our uh, recovery plans, we have some member states, because we have three pillars in our recovery plans, 
uh, green, tra green deal, green transition, digital transition, and resilience. And some use this tool to propose uh, the uh, opening of uh, 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 lithium mines uh, in uh, uh, certain uh, areas in Europe, and we will finance it, of course, with our, uh, let's say, rules uh, for uh, biodiversity and everything, and, and we will open it. And th that's an example where, of, of course, we will not probably be 100% self-sufficient, but maybe half of it, and it will help us to balance. That's why I'm saying just to be autonomous where we believe it is, Autonomous doesn't mean that we will have to do everything on our soul. It means that we will be solid uh, um, in the balance of power uh, that we need to uh, build to, to be uh, uh, resistant uh, of uh, any adverse uh, uh, situations. Uh, last comment. Uh, when I was, uh, just to illustrate, uh, sorry, I'm a little bit long, but just I will end no, just no, that. Good. But it's practical. I remember very well when we started, the, when the crisis started, uh, you remember that uh, um, uh, early um, uh, January in 2020, uh, um, uh, China called us uh, uh, because they had no mask, uh, no ventilators. And we in Europe sent uh, uh, planes full of ventilators and masks. It was in January. Three months later, it was us. And we realized that we had no, not enough masks. And then we were, because at the same time, China increased drastically its production of mass. It's not rocket science to do it, but still, it needs time. But they did it very quickly. And then we realized that some of our factories in China were making 100% owned by European companies, were making mass. So I had a call, a weekly call by, with my counterpart in China, Minister of Trade, and I said, look, uh, we want to have this mass back. And he said, look, this is for Chinese people first. I said, look, but you're breaking, you're breaking the supply chain. And then, of course, we started ourselves immediately, our own production. And five months later, we, 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 we have self-sufficient. So this is just an example of the kind of balance of power that we need. Thank you. Thank you. That's, I mean, Richard, did you want to pile in on this one? Sure. So I, I like this idea of the full map. And I have to say that, yeah. the, that the EU is not the only government I've talked to about how you calculate these things. In the last week, in particular, the UK is trying to do an exercise like this. I was talking at a staff level. But um, I think it's also worthwhile getting into the private sector kind of uh, light touch regulation view as well. So it's not just the government uh, that has to have all this information. Uh, uh, simply alerting uh, the private sector that they should be knowing more about their supply chain and perhaps having some sort of reporting requirement that decentralizes the knowledge gathering might not be such a bad uh, situation because given the complexities of modern manufacturing and how fast it changes and how much confidential information there is, we might be better off knowing who knows what rather than having it all gathered in one place and integrated and things like that. So I wonder, and this isn't just for strategic, this isn't just for supply chain vulnerability, it's also for carbon footprint, for example, or uh, respective labor standards. Who are your suppliers? What are they doing? So that the idea that we should know more about where stuff is made and by whom, I think is a general trend which we really have to go forward. But I would also suggest that as often happens in financial markets, the governments encourage the private sector to undertake more information gathering themselves, even if it doesn't all come together in some government department. And that, that incitation to know more about your supply chain uh, can, can create a ball rolling and it's cheaper and more flexible and more resilient and will certainly multiply what the, what the government's doing. So I wonder if we don't sort of need to think about reporting requirements on corporations about supply chains, first because of vulnerabilities and then second because of carbon footprint. That's coming much further down the road. I, I, Go ahead. You, I just want to jump on it because this is what's happening now exactly on the last comment of Richard. Uh, I'm working now with my colleague Didier Anders, and we will propose uh, a, a, a new directive, it will be a argument, uh, probably in uh, uh, September, where we will ask exactly like you said, because we have to, especially we started with carbon border, I mean carbon uh, CO2, but also it's true with any kind of, uh, let's say, um, forced labor or conditions and, 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 and 
yes, as you said, know your suppliers. So now we have a, we have a big discussions uh, how to do it until where. So my own view here, but it's not yet finalized. So we uh, will uh, this is work in progress. But it's true that we will propose something uh, which will engage companies, uh, which will probably enhance the fiduciary responsibilities of the board members and of the board uh, on this very topic. So now, uh, until where to go? That's a very complex question. Personally, we are we we are not yet uh, we didn't decide yet. But my own uh, view, let's say, it's just my view. So it, maybe it will not land this way. But I want to make this uh, um, acceptable by everyone. So report, of course, in the board. Uh, responsibility in the board. I mean, I mean liability, let's say. Uh, and also in the contract that you have uh, with all with your suppliers, uh, you will need to, to add uh, 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 something uh, which will uh, uh, guarantee you that your suppliers is fulfilling your own requirements. And of course, I will always prefer, let's say, a contractual obligations uh, than something which will be more demanding. Uh, uh, and and, and we we'll see how it works. But I know by experience because I did it on, on myself when I was a CEO, uh, and, and 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 especially when I when I had many factories in China, and I was I was very careful because we had many factories, and I was afraid that one day I will realize that in some of my factories, uh, 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 I will discover that uh, a, a young a young lady because we, have, we had many ladies in, in this factory at that time, where, who could have been below 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 eighteen, and and, and then I, I I put this, and by example. Uh, it worked, so so I I, I I think this is exactly the kind of things we are working in. But here also another area, Richard, where where your your insight will be very valuable, and, and a lot of things uh, will um, will happen also in this dimension. Fantastic, fantastic! It feels like things are really moving. I better we've only got about three minutes left, so I'd better take some of the questions from the audience, um, even though I know I have lots more. Um, I think what the first question would is directed to you, Thierry. Uh, I, it's one of our audience asking, what is your view on the cohesion among member states on questions of industrial policy, given the increasing national protectionism over vaccines, local sourcing, and rumors of intense battles internally in the commission? Can you talk a bit about how cohesive is it really? What are the main battle lines? And is there really political momentum for taking big steps? Yes, the momentum is definitely here. There is no battle within the commission because the commission is an, is an executive body and we have to report with our legislator. Our legislator is, a, is, a, is a, uh, of course, the parliament and, 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 and the European Council, like the Senate and, and, and like the Chamber in the US. And, and, and of course, for us, what is important is that now, because of the crisis, everyone, I think, realized, believe me, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time with every single member state, that our strength today is to be a continent. Of course, you will have like, always, like a state uh, in, in Delaware, they're playing some games, uh, I know, uh, uh, versus uh, uh, what is happening in, in um in, uh, uh, in in California or, or, in, or in Texas, it's true. We all know that. So we will have always to cope with this. But at the end of the day, I should tell you that yes, the feeling and because of the crisis, because of the crisis, in three dimensions: health, of course, and vaccines; digital, of course, was also extremely important; and resilience. Believe me, there is a very strong, the very strong understanding of our strengths is to is because we are alone, and you know. We had a discussion uh, not not too far. That saying, oh, how should we should we be should we be um, um, uh, totally open or open uh, under our conditions? And 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 look what we have done uh, with the foreign uh, uh, investment spending. Uh, it demonstrates that yes, we are welcoming now, but at under conditions. And it's true that probably two or three years ago it would have been impossible. Peggy, it's giving you a very good sense of what's happening now here in Brussels and New York. Fantastic. Well, we literally only have 40 seconds left. So very quickly, Richard, I'm going to ask you, do you believe that Europe can achieve this ambition of fair partnerships worldwide, given the power imbalances that we see? Can you respond to that in 30 seconds? Yes, I do. I think it, Europe is a, a massive uh, economic bloc. It has a regulatory power that's already shown its, its uh, clout in privacy and other areas. 
And uh, I think there is a harmony of views on some of this external stuff, not on everything inside the EU, but some of this external stuff, everybody understands that the game has changed. China and the US are no longer great friends and Europe could get trampled in between unless they do something. I think that's widely understood. And I do, I do think they will be able to do something given the economic clout and all the talent uh, that exists in this continent. Fantastic. Well, on that very upbeat note, very positive note, I'd love to thank our panelists, Thierry Breton and Richard Baldwin, for a fascinating conversation. And it's great to know that there are some real concrete initiatives coming out of this. So thank you very much, all of you. And to the audience, thank you for listening and stay tuned. Thank you. Bye-bye.